and very welcome to, to Anne Palmer and to Philippa Duncan, um, two very knowledgeable experts in the work and life of um, Eric Lokshaw and Claude Boucherain. Um, Annie knew both the artist and so did Philippa, so it's great to get a first-hand, um, you know, experience, uh, knowledge, ex information from, 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 from my colleagues. Um, so, um, yeah, so obviously Annie Palmy is farmer, has been working with Strauss and Company for the last 10 years and before that with Stefan Wells and Company. Um, Philippa is an independent um, collection con collections consultant, um, art advisor and researcher, and she's also on the board of the Eric Loebscher and Claude Boucherain Trust. So it's fantastic having, having you both with me this evening. Um, I've always had uh, enjoyed both artists' work and I'm very interested in, in, in their histories and their place in South African art history. Uh, where I'll start this evening is with a lovely photo of um, Anne with Eric. Um, this was in 2012 at a lunch that was hosted by Strauss for Eric and for Claude. And I thought this is a nice way to kick off um, any, you know, maybe maybe you can tell us more about this day and about your relationship with, with both artists. Well, yes, I, I remember this day clearly. It was actually the last time um, I saw Eric. We were selling that lovely picture behind me of the coffee pot. It was uh, on the front cover of our catalog and uh, it sold for 550,000 uh, rands, which was a very good result. I particularly like that work. We've got a similar one coming up on the sale now. Um, anyway, we decided to invite a few um, of our clients and uh, have uh, Eric and Claude for, for lunch. And there we are in our boardroom and uh, we, we had a great day. I mean, Eric was, was in good, good form and uh, it, it, was a, it was lovely to see him there. Uh, sadly, no more. But anyway, we've got some very happy memories and some wonderful works to remember him by. This is the example of, of, of one of our covers where this book was on the cover and I'm just showing this one because it belongs to Anne and everyone's got their signature way of of showing which catalog is yours because it, it becomes really part of our history here. Everyone has their own catalog, making their notes, et cetera. So that's quite, um, so that's nice to see. And there I've got also Philippa on the far left. She came down to Cape Town for the lunch. Uh, Phil, I don't know if you, you wanted to say something about your relationship with the artist. I'd, I'd always been aware of, of Eric and Claude as, as artists, you know, within, within sort of the 20th century canon. But I, I really sort of sat up and took notice in 2008, where out of the blue, I received this actually quite amusing email from this very charming gentleman who, who was in Sweden. And, you know, the font arrived on my screen and it was, you know, about this big sort of per word. And, you know, he sort of said he had this Eric Lapsha painting and, you know, I was, I was sort of expecting another landscape and then I clicked on, you know, I clicked on the attachment and there was this absolutely phenomenal 1951-1952 um, still life work. And I mean, I remember probably squealing at my desk and, you know, long story short, having met same said gentleman who was in his 80s, you know, at Cape Town Airport and having sort of, you know, fought with SARS to get the painting released and everything else. We eventually had that work on, on the front cover of, of, of a catalog. Um, not that one, but, you know, but sort of similar, similar but larger work. And, <laughs> and um, yeah, I mean, it, it then sold for, I think it was 1.1, 1.2 million, which, oh, yes, you know, in, in 2009, set the record for a living artist in South Africa, you know, which I thought was absolutely fabulous, you know, for, for an artist of, of Eric stature to, you know, to, to be receiving that accolade. And, and also because, you know, it was rather nice to be, to be, you know, making a record for an artist of that age who was actually still alive to be able to enjoy it. Yeah, definitely. That's, that's definitely. And then also I've, um, I thought we'd start with um, Claude, um, just, well, she's older, 1922, born in 1922 in France. And um, maybe we, we'd like to introduce her and her history because, um, I mean, I think a lot more people are 
are no no Eric and not so much Claude. So I thought we'll go ladies first this evening. I always see Claude and Eric as you know this 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 conversation that actually really shouldn't be separated, and you know especially with you know with Claude who you know born in France spent spent born in France spent a lot of her her childhood in in Geneva where her father was was stationed, you know moved back to Paris sort of just before just before the Second World War really. Um, you know, had this incredible exposure to really kind of the best of, you know, of, of modern 20th century art, um, you know, then went over to, to New York um, to, to, study, to study further, um, was exposed at that time to, to what's referred to as the precisionist style, which is this very sort of clean, hard-edged, hard-edged work. Um, artist called, I um, can't remember his first name, but I think it was uh, his surname Spencer, um, you know, very clear, very clear um, influence on on her on her work from from sort of the mid sixties, and then you know fortuitously went back to Paris and um, entered into her studies there at the um, Academy Montmartre. Yes, I've also uh, I've put in a slide here for for Mar Maurice Cantor, who was also a big influence on her work, and I've uh, just thought putting a picture on of him and uh, she said that he reminded her of, of Lippy Lipschitz and uh, I included one of his works, early works, just to see some resemblance or some influence of that you can see from him to her. Um, and then this quote of her um, remembering Morris Cantor saying that um, he, uh, one of his quotes was that when you paint, sometimes you must let the wild horses loose and sometimes you must hold them back. Uh, that quite resonated with me looking at her works and also looking at, at Eric's work and any artist, I suppose, sometimes, um, you know, so that, that quite, well, and then obviously um, we, we handled this work of Claude's named Cantos, which was dedicated to him. So then, so I just thought that's, that's nice to, to add, to look at, look at the influences on her works. And then, well, like you said, when they went to the Academy Mouvement, she was under uh, Fernand Lejeune, and uh, also the, the later the, the influence of Lejeune on her work can be seen in, in, in some of her later works as well as some of Eric's later works. So here yeah, I've got I've got Eric here, um, uh, beautiful. <laughs> I, I love this portrait of him with the red hair and the red jersey, um, sitting sitting in Paris in 1951, coming here from 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 first from, from PE to Cape Town and being encouraged by Maurice von Esch to go continue his studies in, in uh, England and in France. I've got a, um, just this, this Anglo-French Arts Center, a press release from when he was there um, and a, a photograph of him sitting there with, with fellow students. He's the, uh, you can see my cursor, he's, he's the second to the left there. And then his studio in France, his studio was at the, the third floor, second window to the left. And um, so I don't know if you want to talk a bit more about that, Phil, about, about their relationship and both of them, uh, maybe their, their, you know, their connection with Lejeure is, is a nice starting point. Mm, absolutely. I mean, so Claude, you know, Eric had already arrived in about sort of the May, June of, 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 that, of that year, which was 1950. And um, Claude arrived sort of, you know, in the class in the, in the September, which would have been the sort of the start of the, the sort of the official uptake. And there's this lovely quote in, in Eric's book where he goes, yes, like, that's a good looking, that's a good looking woman, you know, and proceeds to sort of chat her up in his absolutely awful French only for her to, to reply in this perfect English, you know, <laughs> and, and things sort of, you know, took off, took off from there. Um, and I think, you know, in terms of the influences of, of Leger, the, the strongest visual influences can be seen in, in Eric's work, um, you know, really kind of dating from, I mean, his figurative pieces to a, to a greater or lesser extent. I mean, a lot of people go very, yes, they're very Leger, but they actually forget about the, the influence of Matisse and Picasso on those early, those early figurative works. But I think you really start seeing Leger's influence or, or sort of lingering influence really 
on on Eric um, in you know sort of where he starts going into more the landscape and the and the abstracts from about 1955 1956. Um, example of of Leger from 1955. I just said 1955. It's, it's 1955. <laughs> um, and there's like you uh, like you mentioned that these later works from the um, there's an example here that's just a, a close up of a work by 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 Eric from 1955, at the year that Leger passed away, kind of a tribute to him that you mentioned earlier. Yeah, very much so. I mean, that's, you know, I mean, that's, that's all very classically Leger and, you know, and recognizable. Um, and, and, you know, interestingly enough, I think the, the strongest, you know, visual references for, for, for Leger actually come into Claude's work when she's working in her more sort of rigid, precisionist style, particularly with, you know, with works that focused on construction and, you know, also during during that sort of, you know, that period in, in Cape Town, there was a, you know, there was a lot of that work, for example, there were a lot of buildings being torn down by the then nationalist government and, you know, these new sort of brutalist buildings taking taking their place. I mean, you know, today, Western Cape Heritage would be up in arms about, about what was happening. But back then it was, you know, it was all part of this, this government, this government program. And, you know, I think it's also quite interesting taking into account how the two of them as artists reacted completely differently to what was happening around them politically. Um, you know, neither of them would, would be found at the, you know, at the front of a, a the front of a march, but they were both incredibly firm in their opinion um, of, of what was going on. And I love seeing their different takes on it. I mean, they were artists obviously living together um, and they had their own studio spaces, but mm. um, different takes on it. It's, it's quite amazing that uh, looking at, you know, at about how they, I think, um, how they supported each other as, as artists. I mean, Eric had to, obviously, they both had to paint funny times, I suppose, because Eric had to, well, yeah. time. And, and Claude um, had to look after the family. I mean, that's, that's a big job. <laughs> no, absolutely. I mean, you know, their, their first child, um, Michelle arrived in, in um, 1952. Um, and, Pierre was born, I think, 1954, 1955, and Francesca, you know, 58, 59. So, you know, Claude was very much, you know, very much a, a, a you know, a mother who, who would have been probably as a, you know, also as a creative trying to, trying to balance some kind of, you know, art production in between, you know, nappies, meals, and also being, you know, being a very supportive, supportive wife. You know, I mean, line yeah. And, and yeah, sorry, sorry, Paul. There's this line in, in one of the articles you sent me where she says that um, Eric is, uh, you know, he also finds time in between to help her out around the house. You know, it's it's quite sweet. Um, also, mm. with, yeah, so quite. Uh, this is another image of um, just showing yeah. Eric's Eric's take on the. Uh, no, this is actually this is Claude's this is Claude's work, and I oh, think no. this one <laughs> this one's actually it's also 1955, and I think it's I think it's incredibly interesting when you look at this because the figures are very you know very sort of cantoresque, and yet the oh. you know the the su the subject ties in so beautifully with that harbor piece, which I always think of as the as the tribute to Leger. You know, it just ties in so beautifully with the two of them. You know, sort of almost in a sense wrapping up that that relationship and that sort of that ode to to someone who was such a such a big influence on them. So I mean, even so if you take that that's 1955 and Claude's, you know, having having the time to actually be able to paint. I mean, that's that's an incredibly successful piece that's that's been produced around this around this sort of you know nappy and bottle production that's that's sort of happening in her own in her own life. That's unbelievable, yes. Now that that's right smack bang in the middle of all that. Now that's something to yeah, aspire well, as to. A mother, <laughs> as a mother of two, you'll understand the chaos around that. <laughs> well, I've still got an unfinished painting from when my first was like, yeah, William's still getting at me about finishing that painting six years later. So no, I have so much respect. <laughs> um, and then I thought, oh, bringing in Bernard Buffet, um, his influence was quite strong on, you can clearly see his, his influence more on Eric's work in the beginning, he was quite mm -hmm. uh, the flavor of the month that time, uh, very, very popular, very financially successful. And mm. um, 
just thought I'd, I'd share a few images. Yeah, if I can just interrupt, there's that lovely sort of enam white enamel bowl or porcelain bowl in the background that's got three pairs on it. And that's a subject that Eric returned to you know, in his in his early still lives, and in fact, the last series of paintings that he that he did before, you know, before before sort of essentially you know leaving the studio was this whole series of still small still lives, but you know, with these plates and pairs, and you know, there were there were one or two prickly pairs as well, and I think there was an avocado that made an appearance. But you know, again, it's just wonderful to see how these you know these subjects kind of come come back. No, it's amazing to see that. I remember those. Um, but also, if you look at the, I'm looking at the tablecloth here. If you go, I'll show you, well, some of the later works that I've got on the screen, this tablecloth comes back. Mm. So this is, okay. and then the color is so much more, I mean, lotus color, you never, you know, you, you did do a bit of that, um, that temp tempered green, um, but I mean, that, that comes through and that, that typical pear that, like you say, keeps, keeps on making its appearance. Mm. I think also with these, you know, the the sort of the, the if you look at his works that he was producing when he was at when he was in in London, um, mm. you know, the, the the buffet palette is far stronger then. Whereas he goes to Paris, and suddenly you still have this very strong buffet influence in terms of how he was approaching the construction, but the color was kind of almost pure Matisse in that you know that kind of fearless use of you know of, of contrasts. I'll show some examples there now, um, which is very clear. I thought this was quite fun looking at the owl, and then immediately I thought about this work of, of um, Claude that popped up. That's just black and white in the Claude Boucherain book by Bruce Arnott, and luckily you sent me a color one, and it just comes to life. It's unbelievable. So this is a stunning early work by him. And then um, uh, also looking at uh, Georges Braque and his influence on, on, on Loebsche. And then I'm going to show the the piece that you were talking about earlier that you that you went to collect at the at the airport which where is there it is yes <laughs> oh yes i i remember this very well it was really yeah. exciting getting this work in we loved it and uh well as you can see we put estimates of two to three hundred thousand on it and we put it on the front cover of the catalog and we were thrilled when it sold for a million rand. And of course, it was a record for an Eric Loebscher. And he was delighted, even though he wasn't uh, selling it himself. Mm. It certainly gave him a terrific boost. I think, you know, as an artist, to see yourself recognized so successfully in the secondary market. And, uh, you know, it was, it was a wonderful moment. And, uh, and you know, for him to have been alive at the time, because often these things happen when, when it's too late, but it was, it was a great achievement. And we, we, I, I felt it was a turning point actually in his uh, reputation in the secondary market. From then on, the market really seemed to pick up for his, his works and right, rightly so. No, definitely. And then if you, now, now looking at, um... These are two, well, one of the works that's on, on, the, on the auction, and you can immediately see here that color that you mentioned, Phil. Mm, that color, and again, that's, that sort of checkered tablecloth appears, you know, those lovely angled sort of, you know, Bernard Buffet pairs as well. <laughs> no, I love this work, and this blue is just, and that red, it's just, the color is just, you know, like, like you say, that it's just, I can't even. It really okay. is a spectacular. And of course, this is on show at the um, uh, Brickfield sale room at the moment yes. for anyone who wants to go and admire it. And then, yeah, then the other still life, we've got another work from 52 that's on the sale. Um, I've just shown here the, oh, it's cut off there. But um, this is a newspaper clipping of, of Eric with Paul the Toy. And they, were to, they showed together at the South African Association of Arts in 1952. Um, so this is quite a nice, uh, I, I quite like this imposing, you know, showing the artwork, lovely. Um, and then also it, it, this is illustrated in the um, Hans Brunson book. And then there it is coming to life. It's also just larger than life. You have to see it in person. And, and also him taking some, um, you know, bringing Strafita. And if you look in, at the papaya, the, the, he scr scratches into the, the paint there, uh, bringing you know, a bit more texture to the artworks. And then uh, this beautiful yellow jug also just jumping out at you. 
And then what's nice about this piece is the obviously the, the verso, which is the where the, the cubist element comes in so clearly that from Brock and Picasso. So that's that's really, really nice to see. Um, and then I, I brought in this was so this is 1952 looking at the timeline. In 1953, um, he was asked to join the new group, which was he was, I think he was the last member. And that was quite a prestigious um, accompli I mean, invitation to be part of that group. I don't know if you want to talk about that other and for if you got anything to say or add to that. Um, I can I can hop in. I think partly why he was asked to to join is having you know having had a having had quite a successful show and he you know will very well received from an art critical point of view show when he arrived back in fifty one. He mm -hmm. was included um, in the uh, Jan, uh, the Jan van, what was it the van Ribbeck Tercentenary Festival, which was held in in nineteen fifty two, and. I mean, he was one of the youngest artists to to be included, and you know, just to give you an idea as to how well they thought about, you know, the the organisers thought about him and his his submission. You know, it, it's illustrated and full in in the catalogue. I mean, it's a black and white catalogue, but you know, it's a sign of the times rather than rather than anything else. But you know, included in that catalogue, and then of course, I mean, I think the final um, new group exhibition took place around about 1955 56. Um, you know, but he he was then included in those, you know, in those, um, you know, in those those exhibitions. I think that's why it says a lot to for a young artist to be included in such an esteemed group and having these um, artists, you know, like uh, I thought the next slide was um, quite interesting. I don't know if you if about um, we've got Francois Krika on the left there, and then we have got Yerik and Claude and Wenza on the left. And um, I don't really understand, I kind of, I understand it that you could, you can buy, buy this painting or exchange it for uh, a washing machine or a dishwasher. Or yeah, I mean, he, he, Eric's, Eric's just being completely cheeky. He's, you know, he's sort of, he's appealing to the, you know, the sort of the, the art buyers saying, well, you can either have a fridge or washing machine or you can have this incredible painting, which is going to outlast them all. You know, it's a sort of, and it's a typical Eric approach to, you know, to to sort of his his relationship with with the public and with you know with collectors. You know, quite sort of shameless in, in that in that respect. You know, yeah. with and then um, uh, and all these there's so many nice newspaper clippings of uh, throughout the years. Um, and there's that one of uh, of, of his mosaics. Um, so what a lot of people didn't know is that that he did a lot of um, public public works, and um, so that so it was quite an, uh, well very good at, at mosaics. So he was pretty good at anything he put his hands on. Apparently, uh, as, as as what I've heard, he would be very handy around the house building mm. um, cupboards, and also redoing when when he moved in when they moved into Cheviot Place doing a lot of the refurbishments and DIYing a lot. Yeah, I mean, it was that sort of that can do attitude that he, you know, that he approached everything with that stood him instead for, you know, for the rest of his life in terms of projects that he that he took, you know, that he took on. I mean, that's that promenade uh, mosaic sort of bottom left on, you know, that, um, on the screen, mm -hmm. that's actually on the promenade. And it was a building that I, I suspect Harvey Fagan had something to do with. Um, and Fagan and and Loebscher and Boucherain, um were lifelong friends, um, you know. And and you know, Eric Eric got a number of a number of those public commissions through through that you know through that relationship. But also, it shouldn't be seen as a you know seen as a sort of a, a you know sort of an old boys club. It was genuinely because he was you know he was that good. So yeah. No, and I. I Leave that yeah you know, anything that he put his hands to was a success i mean he really mm. was an amazing man um and then just to oh, i've got a for the next slide just showing um books of of the uh, the the venice and the sao paulo Bernale and, and how he was also brought into to ever were invited to to be part of those shows which also says a lot about about him and him being acknowledged and recognized within the the, the art scene in South Africa, which I feel is it's that's that's quite it's quite amazing. Yeah. You know, I mean look, amazing. you know, he was he was also his, you know, his own his own enemy in the sense that he was also invited to show at the 57th Venice Biennale. 
um, and you know when he when he got, got the sort of the feedback from the from the organizers as to which works they'd chosen he sort of you know he he pulled out he you know, because the so 50 um uh, 57 was uh the year that i think it was 57 wasn't it that um stone was the featured artist yeah. at at venice and the the reason the reason that they that they gave him they, the, that they only wanted certain works. This is other works that he submitted were larger than the works that Irma had submitted. So they didn't want the featured artist to be overshadowed by these larger, larger sort of canvases. <laughs> yeah, that sounds. He was he was described as a hot-headed young man, full of vigor and excitement, I suppose. Um, and then I thought what's nice also to mention, Buck also speaking earlier of him doing mosaics. Um, he was also a, a very accomplished photographer, um, him and Claude, and they had their own dark room in their house. So I thought it's nice just to to show these images of District Six that that he took. Um, which Phil, you mentioned earlier, there's a whole box of them. There's a whole they're... yeah, there's a whole archive of these, mm -hmm. and you know, in 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 varied you know in various sort of conditions in that in that respect. So you know, we'll you know the the foundation and the trust will go through a whole sort of you know conservation um you know period of cons on, of conserving these works and then you know once once we've got our space open and everything else it's going you know we will roll out various exhibitions and definitely look at look at including you know including one and so these photographs all focus on district six and the removals and you know the buildings coming down and of course there are corresponding paintings within both eric and claude's work that refer to this but you really you know you really kind of get your get to grips with it visually when you see these you know when you see these these photographs because there's no you know there's no trying to there's no trying to sort of spruce them up they are what they are no, I think they're fantastic. It'll be amazing to see a show like that. I think that'll really bring some some rich, real, real richness, um, a real richness to a show. This is one of the works that that um, that he did in 1972, um, mm. the title "Rape of District 6, that that we handled last year in November, which also um, rare a rare piece. Um, so coming back to, um, I'm going to come back to the family. Um, just that, I mean, both Claude and Eric have family people, um, you know, I, I quite like, you know, looking at artists like having strong foundations um, and, you know, uh, I, I, I just, I thought that was, that was quite amazing to see their family life and how committed they were to, to obviously their arts, their, what, everything that they did. Um, so that's just, I just thought that's quite, quite nice to show. And, and Annie, I don't know if you want to say something about the family or Paul? Um, well, I didn't know them at this stage. I got to know them, I suppose, in the 19, late 1980s. And we're not, we're not quite there yet. But uh, when you get into the landscapes, I think perhaps I might have a bit more to add. I didn't know them here. I recognise Clifton Beach and all that. Of course, yes. I but, love the time that the, the, the photos that the, the the time that it that it displays. I suppose you know the coloring, obviously, and the the outfits, and Claude yeah. always very stylish. Your hair done, earrings, um, you know that proper French. Oh yes, very French, very chic. I love it. <laughs> um, and then uh, Shivia Place, which was, which is very well known in in the Cape. The history, the the artists that went to visit there, the the poets, the Sestiger, um, and then so I think that was an important like artistic hub for people to go. Um, it was, and of course they they were very friendly with a lot of the their contemporary artists, um, Marjorie Wallace and Jan Rabi. Um, they were great friends of of theirs, Ace Cricker, Athol Fugard. They used to hang out at the, the house there, Six Chevier Place. I knew the house um, and uh, I'll be sacked. So they were, they were quite sort of left wing and uh, had to be very careful what, uh, how they behaved and what, who they mixed mm. with and so forth. I had heard a story that um, they, there was a car outside the house with two gentlemen sitting there for hours on end watching the house and in the end Marjorie Wallace went over they knew it was a special branch and she went over and 
offered them a cup of tea. She said, <laughs> these poor men are sitting out there in the dark and in the cold, watching, our, watching the house with all the comings and goings. So she took them a cup of tea. So they had a sense of humor. They were great, uh, great fun. Yeah. And then um, apparently there were lots of fun party nights. I, I love this photo. And then I've got this photo of, of in the house, which um, Paul, you mentioned earlier, the, the, the stake, the bottom of the staircase, the face that, that Claude put yes, into the... So in the in the Bruce Arnott book on on Claude, of course, the you know the the portrait shot that's included of her is is Claude at the bottom of the the staircase in Cheviot Place, you know, next to this banister. And there's always been this sort of you know this discussion amongst the family, you know, is was it Eric or Claude who you know who who sort of carved into it? And for me, it's a hundred percent Claude. When you know when you look at that face and you compare it mm. to those early figurative works, it's you know it's a hundred percent. And the fact that she's standing there, you know, sort of just j smiling gently, standing standing next to it, there's this wonderful sort of you know quiet ownership that I think is you know is very much part of part of the her story, you know, and I, and I think it's going to be her story in in South African art history and certainly I think internationally as well because. I do believe that that's you know that really will be will be the next step, and it's you know it's a it's a discussion happening within you know within the family and the foundation you know taking that further, and you know sort of I'd always said you know when when the house goes on the market because unfortunately the family had to sell the the house you know it was it it was just it was too expensive to maintain and the, so much maintenance would have had to be been done and you know I said please you've got to make sure that we get this you know we get we get the banister for you know for the for the foundation and unfortunately with all the chaos kind of happening with um you know with, with selling the house and getting everything organized it was it was kind of overlooked so we have a we have a sort of a separate agreement with the new owners whereby they, they're not allowed to do anything to it and if at any point they decide they want to you know completely change the staircase we get the we get the banister <laughs> yeah. so if I'm, I'm going with time well with um 1966 i'm just looking at um about Eric and Claude, him winning the Carnegie grants, going to America and just looking at their styles and then just looking at some of the art from this from this period. Um, and then I, I saw this funny um, talking about works coming forward now about Eric talking about the gallery hiding news in the cellar. And um, that was quite funny for me about him him you know, going to the media about where all the nudes in the National Gallery, why are they hiding them? And mm -hmm. then immediately with the first work of Claude that's chronolog chronologically on the show is this work from 1969, um, this uh, Adam and Eve expelled from the Garden of Eden, like no shame, like why should we be ashamed, you know? Yeah. I, I love yeah. that. And then also um, the, the hard edge, the acrylics, um, and then, as you mentioned, bringing the figures in, it's, it's quite, um, I think, mm. I think it's a very a great work by her. It is. And I think, you know, I mentioned earlier, the sort of, you know, Claude sort of, you know, got, got on quietly with whatever it is that she needed to do within her life and her artistic practice. And I think this work is a perfect example, you know, of, of Claude in a sense reacting to, you know, Eric would go for a front page and Claude would simply make, statement <laughs> yeah <laughs> i think that's that's great that's and then, um, this this work is is in the busana book it's it's illustrated there so it was um it's always fun to see the works in color you know once um i remember at, at school studying you know art and getting all the black and white images having no real internet so, you know and then so when you actually see the works in color it's just and it's, it's always mind-blowing yeah no it's always mind-blowing you look at those old <laughs> art books exactly jealous, jealous of all the the kids in europe that get to you know go see all these works and i mean i suppose we just needed to go to the national gallery yeah um and yeah so i also just added this image this hard edge work of just showing how that trip to america influenced both artists and and um eric starting to work with acrylics um and yeah, this is an example of, of one of his acrylic pieces, a hard edge. And then um, this is a bit later work from 1981. It's uh, titled To the Morning. And um, 
I thought this was quite a nice marriage between not, you know, one could assume that it is the artist couple, but those hard edged mountains in the backdrop and then these beautiful figures in the front raising their glasses to the new day. Um, mm -hmm. Lovely. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think Claude's been incredibly successful in the way that she's, you know, she's handled this sort of, you know, this kind of gentle transition from the hard edge work that she kept, you know, she, she kept at right, right through the, the 70s, um, you know, whereas Eric always said, you know, 1966 discovered acrylic, but abandoned it, you know, by the time 1970s sort of kicked in, which is true-ish. <laughs> <laughs> but um you know looking at Claude you've got those wonderful hard edge you know mountains in the background and these lovely lyrical figures sort of coming in you know coming into the foreground and I think you know it's interesting because Eric apparently always painted with with music in the background whereas Claude wanted quiet and yet often when I look at Claude's work I can actually hear music it's it's quite a it's quite a strange it's quite a strange thing, especially knowing that she she preferred the quiet when she when she painted. Uh, yeah, that is it is interesting how that, and it, yeah, interesting. So funnily enough, when I, sometimes when I look at Eric's work, knowing that he worked with a lot of loud classical music, there is a quietness in his in his in his landscapes. I mean, no exactly. people, no cars, yeah. stillness. Yes, mm. exactly. Mm. So it's just the cataloging on on the two to the morning, and then the showing it that it was on exhibit at the University of Stellenbosch, an exhibition there of, of Claude's. Um, and then uh, jumping now into uh, to camping and friends, um, showing some, some old photographs um, of, of these artists going on their trips. I mean, I'm thinking of Stanley Pinker and all of his co Bockefeld's artworks and, and Eric and his works in this, of the Siederberg, the Overberg, um, these just kind of, I love these photos because it just kind of puts you in, on the scene, knowing that there was something happening in the back, on the back end, you know, not, you know, so mm. I, I quite, quite enjoy these and always the dogs and Claude dancing in the back there. It's, it's, it's lovely. Yes, they, they, these were very famous camping trips that a lot of artists, they were all friends, Sandy Pinker depicted a camping scene in one of his works that we sold a couple of years ago and exactly. the Wayne Bros used Walker to go Falcon. camping and they they had lots of fun camping in the Cobalt of And you can see that and I think you can see it in the pictures and you can see it in the you know you can see it in the in the art produced during that time there is a um there's hmm. a vigor and an excitement behind them I think to, to be able to bring that across is is, is amazing um and then I well, thought to talk about Ruth Brown School of Art um Eric Founded and started it in 1971, very important um, non-discriminating art center in South Africa. And a lot of people came here and I thought, well, this, this is where he was for 25 years. And he changed a lot of people's lives. Um, the other day, somebody walked in here and just again told me about him, you know, mentoring her and wanting me to tell the family about, you know, just how thankful she was for the time that, that she could have with them. And Phil was mentioning that earlier too. Um, well, I don't know if you want to jump in there. Yeah, I mean, look, when, you know, when, when, the pro when the project for the Ruth Prowse came about, I mean, the buildings that were handed over to them looked nothing like the photograph on your screen. I mean, they were, they were really kind of falling apart. I mean, the house itself was part of one of the original um, farmhouses of the Rudablum estate, which actually had been farmed by one of Eric's um, forefathers, well, great, 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 great grandfathers, sort of, you know, type sort of thing so there was already kind of a personal connection for him there and um you know I mean certainly when I've spoken to to Pierre Eric and Claude's son you know he's spoken about and somewhat grudgingly spoken about the the endless weekends and school holidays that were spent you know fixing these buildings up so that the school could open and I mean this year in fact is the 50th anniversary of you know of of the Ruth Prowse and, you know, the fact that, you know, it receives no, as far as I know, it receives no government funding, it's all completely self-funded, you know, with, with various um, donations, et cetera, that, that come in and obviously, you know, the fees, um, you know, it's testament to, to that legacy that it has actually managed to, to last that long, you know, in, in a sort of, you know, in a market where, where a lot of smaller art schools have, have unfortunately been forced, been forced to close because of, because of funding problems. 
No, that's very sad. So it's, I'm glad to know that it's and going on the website, it looks like it's going great and lots of things happening. Well, it is. There. I mean, their, their, current, their current director, Eunice Hussain, is she's an absolute powerhouse of a, of a woman. She really is. And I mean, looking at these, looking at these photographs here, I mean, there you've got Claude, you know, dressed for a day at the beach. I mean, that, that dress is probably one of those sort of, you know, those sort of terry cloth, you know, sort of boob tube styles, maybe with the halter neck, you know, and she's busy mixing, you know, plaster or whatever, whatever it is in that bucket, you know, and, and that, and that was the, that was the thing. I think, you know, I think Eric also had, you know, had this way about him where he got people, you know, he got people involved and that's, that's the skill that's the skill into itself to actually be able to, you know, to get people on board and help. I would have gone and helped. That looks like lots of fun. <laughs> yeah. And here's a, here's a scene of, of just um, one of the, the, the live drawings or the drawing sessions there. Um, and then um, here's another news clipping of uh, Kinsati Cobb and there's talk about uh, Claude and Stanley and Eric being displayed at, 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 at Arau. Um, and just some more news clippings. I'm just gonna, uh, I mean, this was quite interesting that you spoke about earlier about um, some of the comments that 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 Eric wasn't afraid to make to the media. Well, I mean, exactly. I mean, you know, if if a, if an artist today made that kind of statement, you know, firstly the gallerist would have a nervous breakdown on the spot, and you'd sort of suddenly find everyone offloading those, you know, that artist's artwork at Strauss because you know their market was dead. You know, it's like gone. Everyone doesn't, you know, they don't want. And there's Eric saying, "Well, you know, South Africans are just terrified of buying modern art." Yes. Uh, definitely, and, and also just not afraid of taking on projects, even though, you know, it didn't always come through. Um, and then, uh, yeah, like, you know, this. yeah, sorry, Phil. No, he was, you know, he was just never afraid to, you know, to put a business plan together for the betterment of artists. You know, that that was always the thing is very much with him and Claude both. You know, it was always about improving artists and, you know, what artists could be exposed to. It wasn't just their story or their artwork. You know the 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 drill hall project was to actually create a platform in 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 Cape Town that would be entirely artist managed um, and allow them to to effectively exhibit the best of what they wanted to to show mainly because they were highly critical at this point of the you know the exhibitions program at the at the National Gallery it obviously you know wasn't wasn't inclusive enough or you know or however they they perceived it. No, it's great that they were so involved. Um, this is a nice clip of, of just showing them together, uh, showing together, and there's a little um, exhibition brochure. Um, just a few more clips. Um, it's always just nice to see them, you know, always mentioned together. Um, and then uh, this is dated 1990. So the next artwork that's coming up is this work from 1991. Um, the old key for Jetty at the waterfront, um, which I think is a, is a lovely example by Eric and also in a sense bringing the two artists together. Again, um, you know, Claude always doing the, mostly being known for, you know, lots of the derelicts uh, buildings, like you can see in the top left corner there and the boats. Um, and then him bringing his landscape into his, into his depiction of this, of this dock, um, dock scene. Yeah, if you go into a lot yes, of this. Yes, 1991, colors. this painting was done, uh, and it's called Key 4. So, I mean, it's fascinating to think that that's what Key 4 looked like in, in the, before they built the, the Key 4 re restaurants and so forth. That and are there now. And, but this is an electrifying work. I mean, the colours are really fantastic, and it, there's a terrific... Uh, energy and, and an unusual subject matter really for Eric, but a uh, very, very uh, sort of a unique piece, absolutely fantastic. And then I'll go through, that's just some of the cataloging. Um, this work was on show at the uh, University of Pretoria gallery. So that's another thing um, that Phil mentioned earlier was that, that Claude and Eric were very conscious of not just showing their works in Cape Town, but, but getting out there, getting to Pretoria, you know, getting their works shown all over the country. Um, and then looking at some of uh, some of Eric's, like, you don't see them very often, but looking at some of the seascapes, this is um, one of Clifton Rocks from 1955. 
thought this was just a fantastic um, movement, beautiful piece. And then this one, like a stillness, but also um, uh, in the front, it's like, you know, this, this rowdy store, like waves, but in the background, you know, you can see the storm, storm closing and I don't know, it's just such a, such an interesting work. Um, and then the surfers of this is this is Claude Boucherain's um, surfer. She went to uh, down to the beach with to to watch her boy or her son, sorry, um, mm. surfing, and also Clive. Um, and then going on the road, um, traveling. Uh, Eric was a, a, a traveling salesman in a sense, a color consultant for Plascon for for a long time um, from the late 50s, I believe, or, or early, I think it was from 1954. When did he start joining Plascon around? I think it was 55, 56 that he, that he joined Plascon, yeah. And this is a great image. I love this call that you got um, showing the camping music and um, yeah, just well, his, you know, you, you have a soundtrack for your camping experience and Eric had built himself a, you know, a drawing box to take with, which, you know, he's actually dated the box, 1972. <laughs> So they, it, may have, it may have had a predecessor, you know, I mean, there's also there's this lovely um, uh, sort of, you know, when he's being questioned about, you know, how did he kind of, you know, start getting to grips with the landscape and he, he references a camping trip that they, they did as a family, I think it was on a family farm um, uh, in about 54. 455 and he said you know he was he was trying to draw and he just it wasn't coming right so he picked up a piece of burnt wood from the fire and yeah. found that charcoal suited you know suited the the subject matter that he was trying to 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 gather so he immediately started sort of you know burning other sticks that he had he'd have more charcoal and you know and that was that was very eric i mean early on he he was also known as the artist who ground his own pigments you know he said you know he said afterwards he only really did that for about a year because it was actually bloody hard work <laughs> it was far easier to to rather sort of you know find find pre-made you know ready ready-made you know paints from a supplier um, which, you know, he was never never afraid to to really kind of try, you know, to experiment with things, try things, you know, have the authentic artistic experience. I love that about him. Yeah, I just always like also with if you look through this, through the through how he's uh, painted from the 50s through to the 2000s, continually pushing himself. Um, mm -hmm. and then I mean ending up with with his mastery style with with these landscapes that he's so well known for and which I mean mm -hmm. everyone loves him for, everyone knows yeah. that's an era. I mean, in this in this particular work, I mean, if you look at if you look at that foreground and then you refer back to that jetty painting, yeah. it's that same, you know, that same approach. He's, you know, he's making sense of a subject um, in two completely different contexts, but you know, similar approach, you know, very similar, similar palette, just you know, really kind of getting getting to grips with it and you know, and translating it in a way that that he understood and is very successful. And and Anne mentioned, um, I mean, Anne, your favourite area is, is the Overberg. Well, yes, because that's how I came to know them, because they used to visit, well, Eric, of course, being a, a paint rep, he was travelling around a lot, and I think he loved the Overberg. He did an awful lot of paintings around there, and of going to Grayson, where we happened to have a place, and I met him. And go there at they they also had mutual friends and we used to have lots of jolly parties in Grayson. So I'm particularly um, fond of those works because they really mean something to me. Um, we had a wonderful painting on our last sale, which is actually called Grayson. And this this sort of abstraction of the landscape and these very strong colours, absolutely brilliant. I've never seen anybody do that. Uh, I think he really, that, to me, these are his finest works because they're really unique to him. Well, they are. But and I, I think, you know, if you if you look at the way that he's, you know, he's captured the, the drama of the, you know, of that very Cape landscape and Cape sky, and you compare it to this, you know, to the same drama that someone like Pierre, for example, captures in his, you know, in his felt paintings. You know, there's 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 a similarity there, which also can't be can't be overlooked. I mean, their approach is obviously entirely different, 
but they both get to grips with that that drama that is you know inescapably you know that force of nature right and I love the road just that's all you see to kind of ground the work to to, to the to, to real life in a way because mm -hmm. you think can it exist in a landscape like that but somehow yeah. the road makes it means it's really there it's real mm. you can drive along that road if you want to and when you drive there you feel i mean i i have never looked at the landscape the same since i've come to know Yerick's work whenever Me i drive too. i say to william yeah. i've got to take a photo because exactly you know. every time we go there now i say gosh it looks just like an eric <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah. It, it, also, it doesn't just capture the landscape, it catch, captures the feeling of a place, which I think mm -hmm. makes him such a successful landscape artist. It's, it's unbelievable. I love it. And then not, and also that that he's that the that he's that his abstraction also just always creeps in somewhere, you know, that that mm -hmm. that that groundwork of what he's learned, um, that that foundation is is pulled through. Um, so these both both of these works are in the in the in the Hans Bunsen book by Eric Loebscher, which was a fantastic, um, fantastic book. Um, and then we've got this, this also uh, beautiful work, uh, which shows the, the door near Lanesburg, um, which also captures that, that also that quietness, you know, if mm. when, when you're in the mountains, it's just this quietness that comes over you. Um, and it just calms you down. It's, it's beautiful. And then, um, that's the, that's the cataloging there. I just thought, well, there's another, uh, it's, it's a pic just to show 50 years. I mean, uh, it, it ended up being 60 years, six, six decades of, of painting for, for Eric and for Claude. That's unbelievable for these artists. I think that's an, another reason why I think the artist focus is so important because both artists were so, um, you know, they, they prolific and, and innovative throughout their careers. Definitely. Uh, there's there's Eric in his in his studio with his grandson, and like you mentioned before, um, surrounded by his landscapes. That that landscape is fantastic. Um, and then a few photographs of 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 some of their things around their their um, their studios, camping hats, and um, Claude's kite that I believe. Uh, that's also how did she do this so a, oh you said to me this to me a bit earlier so this is part of a calendar or it, yeah it was it was then you know then the image was used for a calendar and I'm I'm quite sure that Claude would have somehow done quite a lot of the artwork in there or mm. you know um and I think there was a connection with with Pierre their son with Hurt and Carter or certainly on the printing side so that's probably how how it came how it came about but, you know, that's also going to be very much part of the, you know, part of the Heritage Trust and the Foundation's job is to, you know, is to bring all of these elements, elements together and, you know, do what's referred to as a forensic audit of, you know, of, of the exhibitions and locate the works and, and all those, those wonderful things. I mean, this is such a gorgeous picture of Claude in her, in her studio and you can see there in the bottom bottom right that large flat palette that she she was using and you know she even later on had them had them on you know little sort of like sort of tables with wheels so that she could move them around from you know from canvas to canvas and you know continue continue painting uninterrupted i love that um and then here we go with the with the um Eric Loebscher and Claude Bushrain Foundation, which you're very much a part of, and I can imagine it's it's um, fascinating to 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 be able to to be a part of it, and also the, I mean a lot of hard work has gone into um, planning it, and it's due to open next year, I believe. Yeah, I mean we we were aiming for this year, of course, you know, COVID interrupted everything. I mean anyone who's trying to get building building permissions or renovation permissions through the city of Cape Town this year will or even last year we'll understand the frustrations but everything is is in is in the works um and you know i'm not sure when we when we're going to get yeah so are we going to go through the video or not yes i want to yeah, yeah. i think so um I, i've worked with uh kevin fellingham architects um on the on the interior 
and you know Kevin and Alex who's who's the who's the second architect they you know went came on site to to Cheviot Place so you'll recognize elements within this proposed interior that red table for example is actually Eric and Claude's um, dining room table which is hand mosaic weighs a ton we managed to move it without having to take it apart um, this little reading corner nook was actually in Eric and Claude's living room so we've you know we're recreating those those spaces um, and you know the idea is is that the the space will both provide obviously storage for for the family collection as well as the place where we can you know, continue the the research into in, you know into their careers and also their their contemporaries as well because that's an important conversation. There's all my gorgeous storage. It makes me very happy seeing seeing I that. Of course, it. the work on works on paper nook as well. Oh. You know, don't forget those. So you know that's that's all been very very exciting. Kind of watching it watching it come to come to fruition, and. It's it, look. It's going to be an incredibly exciting project going going forward, and really one of the first of its kind in that sense that there hasn't really been another artist based foundation, you know, launched launched in South Africa certainly to this to this extent. So when uh, Philippa, when when do you when's the projected opening day, or is that the Oh, you know, it's, I'd, I'd love for it to all be done by the time we have Cape Town Art Fair next year. But, you know, that's all going to, to really boil down to, you know, the, the builder and the, the actual installation. Um, mm. the, 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 the sort of the interior renovation will start beginning of, beginning of November. Um, you know, so it's going to be incredibly exciting to to see all of you know to see all of that that happen. Also, slightly daunting and you know having to sort of keep you know keep an eye on it and <laughs> make sure that everything's everything's on track and you know something hasn't been something has been moved or you know anything anything like that. But look, it's it's going it's going to be phenomenal and it's also a space that the you know the 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 family and you know the grandchildren and the great grand grandchildren at some point you know really a space where all of them can can contribute towards this incredible legacy. No, I'm looking so much looking forward to all the exhibitions and I think it's going to be fantastic, especially like you mentioned, you know, bringing, um, for example, this piece um, is a piece that 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 uh, Pinker made for Claude. And mm, yeah, about just to have these works together and talking with each other and it's the same, you know, this the, the chronologically what was happening in, in their lives and let the pieces mm. talk to each other. I think I think that's going to be fantastic. So that thought this was an amazing, amazing piece, which I love. Um, and then uh, this this traveling traveling fig plant, if I can put it like that, which was mm. a Cheviot place and is now with the humans. And um, hopefully we'll, we'll stand the test of time going forward. <laughs> Yeah, well, when I when I first saw it at at Cheviot Place, I just I, I'd always admired it and I'd admired it as well because it had been on that corner on that balcony for decades, you know, and it had survived, you know, survived how many southeasters. So when it was getting to the point of you know having to sort of you know pack up and you know the final decisions about what was staying and what was going, I said you have to take it. I mean, it's it's <laughs> too fabulous to to leave behind. And of course, I I immediately wonder where all of these interesting little sort of you know cacti etc came from. You know what the what the story was kind of behind those. But yeah, don't know if don't know if I'll ever figure that one out. <laughs> um, and then just as one just once again, want to welcome everyone to please come to to Brickfield Canvas, which is in Woodstock, to come and look at our wonderful, uh, I think, uh, wonderful presentation of all, all the works coming on sale. It's um, it's really fun to walk through it. Um, it's, I always say it's it's a once in a lifetime thing that you're gonna see all of these artworks next to each other. You know, it's um, it's never gonna be again. So it's, it's moments in history for us as well. We feel very proud of our catalog and the works that, that we get to show together. Um, yeah, so that's that's the end of our of our webinar. Um, I don't know if, if if Lee if there was any anybody in the chat boxes that had any questions. Was there? Oh, now you're muted. Oh, you need to unmute yourself. Nope. No sound.
<laughs> okay, she's going to come to me. Okay. <laughs> oh, to me. When, when, in, when in doubt, join a colleague. <laughs> uh, the speaker stopped working. Okay, here's me. Um, the speaker stopped working, so there are some questions. Oh, great. If you want to read out. Oh, fantastic. Um, from well, let me look. Everybody going um, through the but so there are quite a few questions I think we wanted to start with um, this one for you Philippa um, do you think Claude is underrated due to her not being a having a full career in the artist while bringing up the kids um, and then only painting again in the 1990s the question from John P <laughs> um, okay I <laughs> There's sort of there are many ways of, of looking at it. I mean, look, I think she's I think she's grossly underrated. Um, you know, and and especially because, you know, as I as I always remind everyone, just remember, Claude is the one who had a book published first, not Eric. <laughs> so, you know, but um I think it I think it is, you know, I think I think there has been a certain amount of of playing down her her importance and you know, and also the fact that she she really wasn't a Sunday painter. I mean, she she really did try and find that that kind of that mother wife artist balance within within her own life. I mean, as demonstrated by that 1955 piece with the you know the the fisherman um, on the on the quay earlier on. Um, you know, and she was she was an incredibly consistent painter. I mean, she you know she exhibited in every single um, of the South African Artists Association salons that they had in the Cape, for example, and those started, I think, from 1964, 65. You know, she was already, you know, she was showing in those. There was there was work always being being submitted to to exhibitions, but you know, it, it was only really once you know the book was published, she started having you know more solo shows that really that that conversation became more about Claude. You know, and Claude Boucherain. I mean, the, I've only ever come across one Claude painting that's actually signed Lopesham. You know, she she steadfastly kept her, you know, her 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 maiden name, and in that sense, that kind of that that French sensibility about it. Um, and you know, I think I think what what does need to to be done is is a very firm conversation always about Eric and Claude, because I think dividing them divides the, you know, divides the role that they played in each other's lives and work, but to certainly give each an equal voice and an equal footing within that conversation, so that it doesn't just become about, you know, Eric and his front page was, you know, Claude making her statement, you know, in a far, far quieter and sort of in a sense more genteel, genteel fashion. Um, but again, that's, you know, that's work for, for us at the, you know, at the trust and the foundation and, you know, making sure that going forward that there are these, these exhibitions that show how important they were as a couple and as foils to their, you know, to, to each other's artistic practice. Thanks, Philippa. I think there's also a question that I thought um, you, you or Anne might be able to talk to. Uh, there's a question about uh, Eric uh, made his own paint um, and magenta was one of his favorites and it seems to be evident in one of the pieces on our sale, uh, the first still life that was shown in the presentation. Um, do you think this is a unique color palette specific to him as an artist? I'm not sure if it's it, so I think what set Eric apart from anyone else working at the time in, you know, in the South African art scene was the way that he painted and that incredible sort of layering effect that he that he brought through where he'd, you know, he put a very clean sage green paint a an aubergine on top of it, scrape back and then add red. I mean, you know, nobody else was was paint was painting like that. Um, so there was this incredibly, you know, this this incredible bold approach to to the way that he was painting, and then you 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 see it even more when you go into those into those euphorbia works from sort of 1955. You know, he sort of he he looked at that subject matter for about three or four years, where he kept he kept going back to it. And I mean, and there you have you have again this you know these incredibly intense reds coupled with green with 
you know, black outlines and, you know, intense blues and, you know, very clean yellows, like all these primaries, but then there are all these complementary colors being brought in as well. And, you know, and again, just this incredibly unique, unique or new, you know, new way of, of painting. Um, and Claudia, Claudia says, wonderful about the balustrade, and it would be good to make known to the heritage department at the city to include this info on grading notes for the house. So just a mouthful. I, I think not, because then I will never get the balustrade for my foundation. <laughs> just putting it out there. Okay. <laughs> um, and um, final question, I think, is uh, Eric, landscapes are always filled with emotive content are they landscapes as well as mindscapes do you think and i think that's open to all of you panelists mm, well i would say so yes yeah i mean i think i think eric's landscapes were always a you know a, a, a very clear indicate indicator as to what he was feeling at the time and what he was experiencing um, you yeah. know, you, and, and I think it comes, it comes through especially strongly, I find in, in the hard edge works, um, you know, you, you really get to feel his, 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 you know, you, you get to experience his emotional state on the day that he was painting some of those pieces. Mm. Yeah, I think yeah. the colors and the, and the, yeah, definitely would give that. What else do we have here? I think, I think that's pretty much all the questions. Um, and thank you everybody for um, joining us today. And I'm sorry about my microphone. And uh, thank you to Jean and Anne and Philippa for all your time on this presentation that has given me so much more insight into the artists. Um, yes, I'm learning yeah. more and more about them every day that I come and look at the work and engage with the sale. So please do come and have a look at it at Brickfields in Woodstock. We have a wonderful preview all the way through to our sale on the 11th and 12th of October. So come through in the daytime, nine till five. You can see us there. We'll talk to you about it. Um, and I would like to ha say have a very good evening and we will see you soon. Thank you Thank very you, much. Thank, Thank you, Lee. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Philippa. It's great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Annie. Thanks, Jean. Thanks, Lee, now that you've disappeared. <laughs> Bye-bye. Good night. Good night. Thanks so much. Have a good Bye. evening. Bye.